Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. This is a screencast-matic presentation and recording for the lesson that has us looking at modern Middle East and contemporary issues of the Middle East. Before we get started, please let me encourage you to open up to today's lesson and to scroll down the correct section. And please get ready to answer the key concept questions that happen to appear. So this particular reading is a little bit challenging, mostly because there's different moving parts within this. But understanding these moving parts is key to understanding why there's conflict in the Middle East anyway. So if you need to, you are welcome to replay this presentation for detail, clarity, and elaboration if need be. Let's go ahead and get started by setting the stage. So in the years following World War II, the Jewish people won what for so long had eluded them, their own state. The gaining of their homeland along the eastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, however, came at a heavy price. A Jewish state was unwelcome in the mostly Arab region, and thus resulting hostility led to a series of wars. Perhaps no Arab people, however, have been more opposed to a Jewish state than the Palestinians, who claim that much of the Jewish land belongs to them. These two groups have waged a bloody battle that goes on still to this day. Israel becomes a state. The land called Palestine now consists of Israel, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. To Jews, their claim of the land dates back to 3,000 years, when Jewish kings ruled the region from Jerusalem. To Palestinians, both Muslim and Christian, the land has belonged to them since the Jews were driven out around AD 135. To Arabs, the land has belonged to them since their conquest of the area in the 7th century. So after being forced out of Palestine during the 2nd century, the Jewish people were not able to establish their own state and lived in a different countries throughout the world. So the global dispersal of Jews is known as the Diaspora. And during the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a group of Jews began returning to the region their ancestors had fled so long ago. They were known as Zionists, people who favored a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. At this time, Palestine was still part of the Ottoman Empire, ruled by Islamic Turks. So after the defeat of the Ottomans in World War I, the League of Nations asked Britain to oversee Palestine until it was ready for independence. By this time, the Jews had become a growing presence in Palestine and were already pressing their own nation in the territory. The Arabs living in the region strongly opposed such a move. So in 1917, letter to Zionist leaders, British Foreign Secretary Sir Arthur Belfour, promoted the idea of creating a Jewish homeland in Palestine while protecting the rights of existing non-Jewish communities. Despite the Balfour Declaration, however, efforts to create a Jewish state failed and hostility between Palestinian Arabs and Jews continued to grow. At the end of World War II, the United Nations took action, and in 1947, the UN General Assembly voted to partition Palestine into an Arab-Palestinian state and a Jewish state. Jerusalem was to be an international city owned by neither side. The terms of the partition gave Jews 55% of the area, even though they made up only 34% of the population. In the wake of the war and the Holocaust, the United States and many European nations felt great sympathy for the Jews. All the Islamic countries voted against the partition, and the Palestinians rejected it outright. They argued that the UN did not have a right to partition the territory without considering the wishes of the majority of its people. So finally, the date was set for the formation of Israel, May 14, 1948. On that date, David ben Gurion, longtime leader of the Jews residing in Palestine, announced the creation of an independent Israel. Let's move on to the next section here. Israel and Arab States in Conflict The new nation of Israel got a hostile greeting from its neighbors the day after it proclaimed itself a state. Six Islamic states, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Syria, invaded Israel. The first of many Arab-Israeli wars, this one ended within months of a victory of, for Israel. Full-scale war broke out again in 1956, 1967, and 1973. Because of Arab-Israeli tensions, several hundred thousand Jews living in Arab lands moved to Israel. Largely as a result of this fighting, the state that the UN had set aside for Arabs never came into being. So Israel seized half the land in 1948 and 1949 fighting. While the fighting raged, at least 600,000 Palestinians fled, migrating from the areas under Israeli control. They settled in UN-sponsored refugee camps that ringed the borders of their former homeland. Meanwhile, various Arab nations seized other Palestinian lands. Egypt took control of the Gaza Strip, while Jordan annexed the West Bank of the Jordan River. The 1956 Suez Crisis the Second Arab-Israeli War was followed in 1956. That year, Egypt seized control of the Suez Canal, which ran along Egypt's eastern border between the Gulf of Suez and the Mediterranean Sea. Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser sent in troops to take the canal, which was controlled by the British interests. But the military action was prompted 
in large part by Nasir's anger over the loss of U.S. and British financial support for the building of Egypt's Aswan High Dam. Outraged, the British made an agreement with France and Israel to retake the canal. With air support provided by European allies, the Israelis marched on the Suez Canal and quickly defeated the Egyptians. However, pressure from the world community, including the United States and the Soviet Union, forced Israel and the Europeans to withdraw from Egypt. This left Egypt in charge of the canal and thus ended the Suez Crisis. Arab-Israeli Wars Continue So tensions between Israel and the Arab states began to build again in the years following the re resolution of the Suez Crisis. By early 1967, Nasir and his Arab allies, equipped with Soviet tanks and aircraft, felt ready to confront Israel. We are eager for battle in order to force the enemy to awake from his dreams, Nasir announced, and meet Arab reality face to face. He moved to close off the Gulf of Aqaba, Israel's outlet of the Red Sea. Soon after the strikes on Arab airfields began, the Israelis struck airfields in Egypt, Iran, Jordan, and Syria, and of course, safe from air attack, Israel, or Israeli ground forces struck like lightning on these fronts. Israel defeated the Arab states in what became known as the Six-Day War because it was over in six days. Israel lost 800 troops in the fighting, while Arab losses exceeded 15,000. So as a consequence of the Six-Day War, Israel gained control of the old city of Jerusalem, the Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights in the West Bank. Israelis saw these new holdings along their southern, eastern, and western borders as a key buffer zone against further Arab attacks. So Arabs who lived in Jerusalem were given the choice of Israeli or Jordanian citizenship. Most chose the latter. People lived in other areas were not offered Israeli citizenship and simply came under Jewish control. A fourth Arab-Israeli conflict erupted in October of 1973. Nasir's successor, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat, planned a joint Arab attack on the date of Yom Kippur, the holiest of Jewish holidays. This time the Israelis were caught by surprise, and Arab forces inflicted heavy casualties and recaptured some of the territory lost in 1967. The Israelis under the Prime Minister Golda Meir launched a counterattack and regained most of the lost territory. So both sides agreed to a truce after several weeks of fighting and the Yom Kippur War came to an end. The Palestine Liberation Organization, which came to be a huge dominating force in the region, was really important for Israel. As Israel and its Arab neighbors battled each other, Arab-Palestinians struggled for recognition. So while the United Nations had granted the Palestinians their own homeland, the Israelis had seized much of the land including the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. During its various wars, Israel insisted that such a move was vital to its national security. So in 1964, Palestinian officials formed the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or the PLO, to push for the formation of an Arab-Palestinian state that would include land claimed by Israel. Originally, the PLO was an umbrella organization made up of different groups, laborers, teachers, lawyers, and guerrilla fighters. Soon, guerrilla groups came to dominate the organization and insisted that the only way to achieve their goal was through armed struggle. In 1969, Yasser Arafat became chairman of the PLO organization, and throughout the 1960s and 1970s, the group carried out numerous terrorist attacks against Israel. Some of Israel's Arab neighbors supported the PLO's goals in allowing PLO guerrillas to operate from their lands. And this, of course, would have huge ramifications for the future, especially in terms of efforts at peace. Next section here. In November of 1977, just four years after the Yom Kippur War, Anwar Sadat stunned the world by extending a hand to Israel. No Arab country set up to this point had recognized Israel's right to exist, so in a dramatic gesture, Sadat went before the Knesset, the Israel parliament, by the way, and invited his one-time uh, enemies to join him in a quest for peace. So Sadat emphasized that the exchange for peace Israel would have to recognize the rights of the Palestinians, but furthermore, it would have to withdraw from territory seized in 1967 from Egypt, Jordan, and Syria. U.S. President Jimmy Carter recognized that Sadat had created a historic opportunity for peace, and in 1978, Carter invited Sadat and Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benin to Camp David to the presidential retreat in rural Maryland. Isolated from the press and from domestic political pressures, Sadat and Benin worked to reach an agreement. And after 13 days of negotiations, Carter triumphantly announced that Egypt recognized Israel as its own legitimate state. So in exchange, Israel agreed to return the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt. Signed in 1979, the Camp David Accords ended 30 years of long hostilities between Egypt and Israel and became the first signed agreement between Israel and any Arab country. So while world leaders praised Sadat, his peace initiative enraged many Arab countries, and in 1981, a group of Muslim extremists assassinated him. However, Egypt's new leader, Hosni Mubarak, has worked to maintain peace with Israel since then. 
Now, when it comes to Israeli-Palestinian tensions increasing over the years, one Arab group that continued to clash with Israelis was the Palestinians, a large number of whom lived in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Lands controlled by Israel, during the 1970s and 1980s, the military wing of the PLO conducted a campaign against Israel. Israel responded forcefully bombing suspected rebel bases in Palestinian towns, and in 1982, the Israeli army invaded Lebanon in an attempt to destroy strongholds in Palestinian villages. The Israelis invited, or became involved, in Lebanon's civil war and were forced to withdraw. And in 1987, Palestinians began to express their frustrations in a widespread campaign of civil disobedience called the Intifada, or uprising. So the Intifada took the form of boycotts, demonstrations, attacks on Israeli soldiers, and rock throwing by unarmed teenagers, and the Intifada continued into the 1990s. With little progress made towards solution, however, a civil disobedience uh, affected world opinion, which in turn put pressure on Israel to seek negotiations with Palestinians. Finally, in October of 1991, Israeli and Palestinian delegates met for a series of peace talks. And in the Oslo Peace Accords, negotiations between the two sides made little progress, as the status of Palestinian territories proved to be a bitterly divisive issue. In 1993, however, the secret talks held in Oslo, Norway, produced a surprise agreement, a document called the Declaration of Principles, also known as the Oslo Peace Accords. So Israel, under the leadership of Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, agreed to grant the Palestinians self-rule in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And beginning with the town of Jericho, Rabin and Arafat signed the agreement on September 13, 1993. So the difficulty of making the agreement work was demonstrated by the assassination of Rabin in 1995, and he was killed by a right-wing Jewish extremist who opposed concessions to Palestinians. Rabin was succeeded as a prime minister by Benjamin Netanyahu, who had opposed to the Oslo Accords, and still Netanyahu made efforts to keep the agreement, and in January of 1997, Netanyahu met with Yasser Arafat to work out plans for a, a partial Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank. Now, as peace slips away here, it should be noted that this is the final section to help us understand how and why the Middle East is the way it is today. In 1999, the slow and difficult peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians seemed to get a boost. Yilhud Barak won election as the Israeli Prime Minister, and many observers viewed him as a much stronger supporter of the peace plan than Netanyahu had been. The world community, led by the United States, was determined to take advantage of such a development. So in July of 2000, U.S. President Bill Clinton hosted a 15-day summit meeting at Camp David between the Yilhud Barak and Yasser Arafat. The two men, however, could not reach a compromise, and the peace plan once again stalled. Just two months later, Israeli political leader Ariel Sharon visited Jerusalem's Temple Mount, a site holy to both Jews and Muslims. The next day, the Voice of Palestine and Palestinian Authority's official radio station called upon Palestinians to protest the visit. So riots broke out in Jerusalem and the West Bank, and the Second Intifada, sometimes called the al asqa Intifada, was launched. The conflict further intensified, intensified, with the Second Intifada beginning much like the first, which demonstrates attacks on Israeli soldiers and rock-throwing by unarmed teenagers. But this time, Palestinian militant groups began using a new weapon, suicide bombers. So their attacks on Jewish settlements in occupied territories and in civilian locations throughout Israel significantly raised the level of bloodshed. And as the Second Intifada continued through 2007, thousands of Israelis and Palestinians had died in that said conflict. So in response to the uprising, Israeli forces moved into Palestinian refugee camps and clamped down on terrorists. Troops destroyed buildings in which they suspected extremists were hiding, bulldozed entire areas of Palestinian towns and camps, and the Israeli army bombed Arafat's headquarters, trapping him inside compound for many days. Arab-Israeli relations did not improve with Israel's next prime minister. Ariel Sharon, Sharon, a former military leader, refused to negotiate with Palestinians until attacks on Israelis stopped. Eventually, under intense pressure from the world community, Arafat agreed to take a less prominent role in peace talks. So in early 2003, the Palestinian Authority appointed its first ever prime minister or PLO official, Mahmoud Abbas, and shortly afterward, U.S. President George W. Bush brought together Sharon and Abbas to begin working on new peace plan to known as the Roadmap to Peace. But violence increased again in 2003, and talks stalled. So in the summer of 2005, Israeli uh, officials unilaterally evacuated all of its settlers and military from the Gaza Strip, and then in 2006, Hamas, a militant terrorist group intent on replacing Israel with an Islamic State, won a majority control of the Palestinian Authority elections. So Israel refused to recognize the new Hamas government, and instead in August of 2007, Israeli's new Prime Minister, Yochad Omer, began a series of formal talks with the Mohammed Abbas. Both Omer and Abbas favor a two-state solution to the conflict over Palestine, and both leaders, of course, have an interest in forming an agreement that does not involve Hamas. After many years of violence, hope remains that harmony will one day come to this region, although talks 
can only do so much.